In this edition of Art Rocks, science and light are the constants for a multi-talented artist. You kind of have to think about the same things when you do photography as you do with stained glass. A theatrical depiction of the difficulties faced by veterans. And it really makes you question the power of recognition, the power of awards and the accolades you receive from your peers and from, from everybody else around you, what that can do to somebody's psyche. We meet the brilliant mind behind top selling comics. Uh, just like you would see for a movie, the only difference is that it's broken down into uh, specific images. And hit the high notes with music's masters. It's all ahead on this edition of Art Rocks. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello, this is Art Rocks with me, James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads magazine. We'll begin our show today with the profile of a Baton Rouge artist and gallery owner whose works in sculpture, painting, stained glass, mosaics and photography are sought after. Oh, and she also teaches design at LSU. With such a talent for art, you might be surprised to find out that Mary Ann Caffrey holds a degree in chemistry as well. Let's find out more of Mary Ann's story. The artist's journey can be a winding path. Growing up in Shreveport, arts and crafts were fond activities for Mary Ann Caffrey, but not the subject of formal study. I ended up majoring in chemistry when I went to Centenary College in Shreveport because for some reason I felt that chemistry was very akin to art in a lot of ways, in the creative process um, and in the thought process. After I graduated in chemistry, I went back and took three years of drawing and painting while I waited for my husband to graduate and um, realized that I wish there was some way I could marry the two processes together. While in graduate school at LSU, Caffrey brought together her love for stained glass with the science of electronics, combining the two in box-like glass temples that featured light-emitting diodes. After receiving her MFA, Caffrey began taking on commissions in stained glass and in tiled mosaics. The commission I did for the Lafayette Airport, I. I started looking at the map of Lafayette because I'm really interested in maps and I realized that the streets just go everywhere. They're not really in your traditional grid, but you'll, you may start with a grid, but then they start going in all directions. And it almost looked like the streets were dancing. More commissions came from New Orleans, a stained glass window for police headquarters and mosaic elements for the Louis Armstrong International Airport. Caffrey's artistic skill and curiosity branched into other areas, like jewelry making. I used to do electronic jewelry with um, for mica, and I did some uh, jewelry that would light up with light-emitting diodes, and I would build necklaces that had on-off switches and battery packs and everything. Someone told me once, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. And it's true. And so I had to decide what I wanted to spend my time on the most. And so the jewelry just kind of went to the back burner because I just can't do it all. Caffery has been able to do quite a lot, however, including teaching color theory and graphics in the LSU School of Interior Design. She's also made an impact as an entrepreneur through the Caffery Gallery in Midtown Baton Rouge. Because my father had a hardware store and my mom was a florist, so I, was, I grew up in retail. So that bug just kind of bit me. Caffrey spent many years on the board of the Mid-City Merchants Association, strengthening the network of businesses that regularly bring art events to the community. The gallery is also an outlet for local artists. We also started Caffrey Gallery having group shows, group exhibitions, and they were usually themed, um, and artists, it was 
easier for them to do a piece for a theme show than to, to do an entire body of work. A broad spectrum of the arts are represented at Caffrey Gallery. Stained glass, blown glass, pottery, jewelry, sculpture, drawings, paintings, and photography. A lot of our clientele are very independent thinkers. They don't necessarily look at magazines to see what is popular. They're more interested in their own personal visions of what kind of art they want to acquire and they're not necessarily my painting needs to match my sofa type people. They're mostly quite the opposite. And maybe it's because that's the type of art we have here. Some of the art we have is thought-provoking. Sometimes it will have a message behind it also, as opposed to a pretty picture. So we try to strive for things that are well-made, that communicate something to the viewer, and that have a unique perspective on what they are communicating to people. Caffery continues working in mosaics and stained glass. This piece is destined for the LSU Chemistry Department. But in the last few years, her artistic exploration has grown to include another form of expression. I've always absolutely loved photography, but it was just kind of a little secret pleasure that I had. I never ever even thought of exhibiting it to the public. Photography, as well as stained glass, both of those are all about light. And so it was an easy transition or addition to my glass work because you kind of have to think about the same things when you do photography as you do with stained glass. In 2011, I took a trip to the Louisiana Gulf Coast, and I am from Louisiana, but I had never, ever really thoroughly visited the Gulf Coast, so I didn't really know what was down there. And it was with a group of photographers and scientists who document the coast every year. And when I saw how lovely that uh, the colors were down there, I was so bowled over and um, realizing that we're losing a lot of coast daily. I have done a series of paintings based on uh, what I saw down there. I've done a series of stained glass windows based on what I saw, but sometimes the photographs say it best. And so that's kind of how I got maybe the courage to start showing my photographs. For more, visit caffreygallery.com. Now, let's take a look at some of Louisiana's arts and cultural events in the coming week. For more information on these events, visit the website at lpb.org slash artrocks. And to find more arts activities, check out countryroadsmag.com. The traumas of war often leave soldiers with physical and mental scars. But what happens when returning home reopens those scars and etches them anew? The theatrical production Fear Up Harsh depicts some of the brutal realities a soldier faces when returning home from war. Here's a look. Fira Parsh is about a United States Medal of Honor winner who has come back from the war and been, become quite prosperous uh, as a result of winning the Medal of Honor. And he gets a visit from a, a former colleague from the Iraq War who um, comes to beg him for a favor that uh, only he can he can provide for her, and uh, it's it's about how either uh, granting that favor or not will affect his life. 
there's been an incident years in the past when he was in combat on a tour of uh, combat duty in Iraq, and now he's confined. The lower half of his body, you know, is, isn't isn't functioning, so he's confined to a wheelchair. And he's been he's been praised for his actions, you know, in the line of in the line of combat, which you know led to his injury. But also throughout the course of the play, it's not as easy as what he did was an act of valor. There are other things involved, and it really makes you question the power of recognition, the power of awards, and the accolades you receive from your peers and from, from everybody else around you, and you know what that can do to somebody's psyche, or what they're able to forgive about themselves. You know, So it's a, it's a traumatic physical injury, but the emotional ramifications are, are just as severe. Shane plays the Medal of Honor recipient, and Shane actually is the, uh, the actor, and he actually was uh, a member of the U.S. Army on active duty in, um, I believe, in Desert Storm, or during Desert Storm. When we first meet his character, he um, is this kind of stalwart, uh, typical picture of, of, of a hero, big, tall, good-looking, uh, blonde, all-American guy. And what we learn is that he has suffered from some of the same problems that everybody does, even though his persona has been um, touched up and, and spackled over so that we only see the the, uh, the the prettified version of him. Pentagon likes to have us PR folk look it over, make sure that uh, the optics are Steve right. actually has the extraordinarily difficult task of playing about six different people in the play, one, two, three, three or four of whom are people up the chain of command in the military. So he plays a, uh, a captain, a colonel, and a general at in reverse order in the play. There's uh... There's a great challenge when you're playing a, a multiple roles uh, to to give each character his or her own voice. And I say his or her because in the past I have played both male and female characters in the same play. Another challenge altogether. But uh, to give the character his or her own voice, his or her own physical characteristics, whether it be a walk or a, a way of, of carrying oneself. And uh, it's, uh, it's not unlike the process of, of learning a single character, but you're doing it over the, a broader map. So I, every one of my scenes I think of as its own little play. So I'm playing you know, seven, eight different shows here. Fear up harsh is a term that was in the U.S. Army um, manual, uh, and it referred to one type of interrogation that was uh, permitted. There were a number of very colorful names, I think, for, for uh, interrogation techniques. One was ego up, Ego up harsh, fear up, just fear up and fear up harsh. Fear up harsh being the, the most, I guess, severe version. And fear up harsh was uh, famously the type of, of interrogation that was, um, I, I guess, certain people took license with and, and uh, turned into uh, torture at, at Abu Ghraib and other places. I would never want somebody to come here and say, let me see how you're representing me. And I hope that the audience doesn't feel that this is us telling the real story of the Marine Corps. That's not our purpose here. Our purpose here is more human, using that as a backdrop for a human story. For those who know Marvel Comics, the name Jason Aaron might already be familiar, and for those who don't, remember it. Aaron is making waves not only for co-writing the new Star Wars comic, but also for turning the character Thor into a woman. We sit down with Aaron in this next segment. to sit and make up stories every day. Kind of what I had always wanted to do since I was a kid, but it's um, 
it's a hard business to break into, so I just never really knew how. Um, and I, you know, I, I grew up in Alabama in the, in the deep south in a small town, and then I moved to Kansas City um, about 14 years ago. And I always figured you kind of had to live in New York to, to work in comics. And, you know, for the longest time you did, but um, things are very different these days, and that doesn't really matter where you're from. Uh, you know, a lot of the stuff I do, I work with people who are literally from all over the world. Like the the book Scalp that I did, which was one of my first big, big books, um, that was an international team that put that together. And that the guy drawing the interiors was uh, Croatian and lived in Barcelona. The guy drawing the covers was Scottish and lived in England. The lady who colored it was Italian and lived in London. I lived in Kansas City. The editors were in New York. And then we all worked together to do a book that was set in South Dakota. And somehow that all worked and made sense. Yeah, that's usually the question I get when I, you know, if I'm at a party or something or just talking to an average person um, and I tell them I write comics for a living, they always ask, oh, so you can draw? You know, if you think of it in terms of making a movie, I'm basically the, the screenwriter and that um, I write a full script that has the dialogue, the action, everything. Uh, just like you would see for a movie, the only difference is that it's broken down into uh, specific images. So yeah, I mean, I'll say, you know, this page, four panels. The first panel, we see the ship heading towards the landing bay. Second panel, the ship's landing, we see this guy waiting with a bunch of stormtroopers. Third panel, tight on that guy, and he says this stuff. Fourth panel, the doors start to open. So, you know, just like you would write for a movie script, you're, you're saying everything that happens. Well, I've been writing Thor for a few years now. I did 25 issues of a book called Thor, God of Thunder. This is uh, Thor number one, which was the first appearance of the new uh, female Thor. I knew pretty quickly that I wanted that to be a woman for a couple of different reasons. One, that's it's a story we haven't really seen before. Over the course of Thor's you know, very long publication history at Marvel, um, what, about 60 years at this point, um, over that, that course, we've seen a lot of different people pick up the hammer from time to time. Uh, very rarely have those characters been women. This is where she first picked up the hammer. And the women who did pick it up usually only picked it up for an issue or so and, and you know, slung it around a little bit and put it down and carried on. So I didn't want to do that story. I wanted someone to come along and pick up the hammer and carry it for an extended period of time and really become the new Thor. This is kind of a continuation of... What I'd been doing in Thor God of Thunder, the previous Thor book. So I knew I wanted this new Thor not to be a, a brand new character we'd never heard of, but to be someone from Thor's corner of the Marvel Universe. So given that, you know, it all kind of made sense that this would, then this new Thor would be a lady. So yeah, you know, what is it to open just like the movie? And then, yeah, even though the book shipped a million copies, which no comic has done in over 20 years, uh, it's still sold out. I got a call from my editor-in-chief, Axel Alonzo, who said, do you want to write Star Wars? I just said, yep, you know, I'm down for doing Star Wars. The Star Wars comic that we're doing, this, this first new one, takes place in the timeline of the original trilogy. So it takes place right after the original Star Wars, right after the Death Star blew up. So it's got, you know, all the characters that we fell in love with as kids, all the characters from those original movies, Luke and Leia and Han and Chewie and the droids and Darth Vader. Um, and that's an ongoing series. So we'll be following all those characters for the foreseeable future. When I first got the email that the book was gonna sell a million copies, uh, that did give me a little pause because that's that makes it the highest selling comic book in over 20 years. Uh, but I'm, I'm really proud of how it came out. You can see that the you know the audiences are out there beyond the one that we've had for so long. You just gotta one reach them and two give them something they respond to. I'm really lucky that I get to do 
work from home and get to do something you know, that I really enjoy. Once just a functional tool used by hunters, duck decoys carved today are collector's items and Louisiana is home to some of the top craftsmen. Our Louisiana treasure this week is so lifelike you can almost hear it quack. In recent decades, hand-carved, hand-painted waterfowl decoys have risen to the status of folk art. The use of duck decoys goes back to 500 years BC. In Louisiana, native tribes used them as hunting lures. Modern duck hunters switched to plastic decoys in the 1950s and 60s because they were lighter and less costly. The older wooden decoys that still exist date back to about 1800 and retain their appeal as an authentic traditional craft. As the carving tradition continues in Louisiana, the top craftsmen today create decoys that may never be used for hunting. These are considered fine art and carvers command thousands of dollars for their wooden sculptures. The Louisiana Wildfowl Carvers and Collectors Guild holds an annual decoy carving contest where professionals and novices alike can show off their wooden waterfowl artistry. The competition draws decoy carvers from around the country with cash prizes. But Louisiana claims more world champion and master carvers than any other state. Rock icon Art Alexicus, Grammy-nominated lead singer, guitarist and songwriter from the band Everclear, is working to inspire the next generation of musicians at the new Los Angeles College of Music. Here's his story. We can live beside the ocean, we leave the fire behind, swim out past the breakers, watch the world die. We can live beside the ocean, leave the fire behind, swim out past the river, watch the world die. Yeah, watch the world die. Art Alexakis of Everclear, performing for the crowd, a familiar sight. And soon, this too will seem quite familiar. Art Alexakis, the new songwriting chair of the Los Angeles College of Music helping young musicians find their voice. As way of introduction to the music industry, during the National Association of Music Merchants annual gathering, Art and the kids boarded the bus, the John Lennon bus, an educational touring studio on wheels, to share a bit of creative energy and spin a tune in record time. How about love you, love you? Do you say love you forever? You haven't said that. Huh? Because, I mean, basically, you're saying I've loved you since I've known you. I'm going to love you forever. This is my skill set. I write songs. I'm an okay singer. I'm an okay guitar player. But I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm a good songwriter. I'm able to encapsulate what I want and put it out there in a way that it's, it's hard to be totally unique in, in this era. But I feel like what I do is it sounds like me. You know, it sounds like Everclear, and Everclear is me. And what I wanted to do with Everclear was pretty simple. I was a huge fan of singer-songwriters. I was a huge fan of hard rock bands and then punk rock bands. And I wanted to blend the two of them. One more oh. before. No, let's do the whole thing. The whole thing? It's, it's getting, yeah, it's yeah. getting there. Right. It's getting there. Like working with these kids here, they're working on lyrics here, they're working on guitars, they did the bass and drums. I'm popping in, giving my, my uh, you know, 10 cents, and they're like, wow, I didn't see it like that. They're getting the fact that, you know, even though I'm the old guy, um, I, I have some perspective to give, and I think that feels great. I'm so looking forward to the curriculum next year and teaching classes. I think, you know, songwriting, you can teach people the craft, you can't teach them how to be creative. Same thing with anything else, whether it's music or acting, you can do all the acting lessons in the world, you'll never be Meryl Streep or Daniel Day-Lewis, unless you have that, unless you get that. And it's usually people with some sort of damage that leaves it open for that, such as myself. I was a pretty damaged kid, but one of the ways I soothed myself was through music. 
and through being able to express myself. And I'm, I don't think you have to be damaged to be great, because I know there's a lot of really talented people. I think it's just something you either have or you don't have. You don't seem to lose so much pain. Just have the moment and then it begins. This life is perfect when you let love in. Yeah. And with that, a song is born. For more on the college, log on to lacm.edu and for more on Art Alexicus, go to evercleermusic.com. And that wraps it up for this edition of Art Rocks. Don't forget to visit our website at lpb.org slash artrocks where you'll find feature videos and information on upcoming arts events. Until next time, I'm James Fox Smith and thanks for watching.